Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Cinemaholics. I am not, I repeat, I am not your usual host, John Negroni, but rather your usual co-host, Will Ashton. And, dun dun dun, <laughs> it's time to bring back once more Corey Woodruff. How you doing? There, Corey. I am doing well. Um, it's been hasn't been that long, but it's been long enough to the point where it feels like we haven't been bombarding these poor listeners with our like rambling conversations on random movies. Yeah, I was thinking back. I think eighty for Brady was the last time. We... I think it was. Yeah, so yeah. that was February. Okay, so they haven't been like that bad off, I guess. Right, but I, you know, yeah. yeah. I do think it is fairly rare, though, that, uh, that you know, like we talk more about like the, I guess, oddities of cinema, mm-hmm. not like in the like, you know, like it's not like we're talking about Andy Warhol movies or something. But no. I mean, we just kind of talk about like, hey, what is 80 for Brady? Like, exactly. <laughs> like we're, we're not doing the Barbenheimer podcast. That's what I've I've picked up. Like we're we're much more likely to do the. uh like random uh, David Spade Netflix movie podcast, sure. which is, I mean, if that's our lane, I'm happy to be in it. Well, in that case, though, we are stepping out of our lane a little bit, I guess, because we oh, are talking about one of the bigger movies of the summer. Yeah, apparently so. I mean, it's a, I guess it qualifies as a blockbuster. Um, it's a, it's a big brand. It mm-hmm. came out like at a prime release date. It made money. Like it's everything that we normally don't talk about when we do individual episodes. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's like a thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely not comparable to under the silver lake. Though exactly. I'd love to see someone try and make a streamlined comparison between these two films. They could, this film I should say is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles colon Mutant Mayhem. Yes. Which is, I don't remember the exact number of times that we've seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in theaters. Uh, but I believe, okay, so there was the original three, right? The like the original 90s live action movies. Yeah, the Vanilla Ice era. Sure. Go Ninja. <laughs> You know, yeah. extravaganzas. And uh, if you can hear on that line, that is uh, Poppy, right? <laughs> yes, that is Poppy the Chocolate Lab. Um, she might chime in from time to time with uh, very cynical takes on current IP culture. But, sure. um, you know, just just try to try to drown her optim- her pessimism out with optimism. Um, that's the best thing I know to do. She's a very harsh critic of uh, studio franchises. So, um, you know, she 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 has her she has her voice and she's not afraid to use it. Well, I was going to say, like, you know how when you listen to a podcast and y- you hear something you just completely objectively mm-hmm. disagree to and you want to yell at the podcast host, but obviously it's a recorded mm-hmm. conversation, so you, you can't chime in and whatnot. Just imagine Poppy is that person. For every she time is. we say something completely objectively bad yes. that you just totally disagree with, Poppy is your stand-in being like, yes. no, no. She was hoping that the new Julio Torres movie was actually still coming out this weekend. Um, yeah. <laughs> but sadly, it got pushed back out because of the strike pop. So we'll, we'll talk about problem Easter later. Yeah. Uh, she's she was, just, yeah. She's, she's really like, excited to continue to follow the fascinating character work of Tilda Swin. But yeah, you know, she's just like, why aren't you guys covering the latest film from Neil Blumkamp? Or Christian Petzl. Why are you guys not a fire right now with the right. ones of independent cinema? And it's just like, wow. Did you we have to talk about talking turtles? Yeah. Did you see a fire, by the way? No, I want to though. I hear it's really good. I haven't it done, a, pet- yeah, I haven't done a Petzl since uh Transit. But Oh wow, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Been- um yeah, I would definitely recommend a fire and I would also recommend Undine. I don't okay. know if I ever pronounced that title right, but Very both nervous. are well worth watching. Okay. But speaking of obscure-ish uh, <laughs> German cinema, uh, so outside of those two, um, or sorry, those three original films, there is the, I want to say 2007 animated film. I think that was just yeah. called TMNT. TMNT. And then there were the two uh, live action ones. 
Yeah, and then there was the the, the Michael Bay produced yes. ones in the 2010. So yes. it seems like every decade or so mm-hmm. since the 90s, we get a new variation of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I'm curious, mm-hmm. what is your relationship to this franchise? And uh, where did you stand on these uh, previous films if you've seen them? No, it's like it's weird. Like I genuinely have no nostalgic leanings at all to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I, it's weird. It's like I didn't see the '90s movies. I guess my parents just were like not into that as part of our like VHS rentals. Um, so I, I didn't watch any of them. I've never seen the older films. I know what they are, and I know what the characters are, and I remember seeing the toys like at Toys R Us, and maybe like a toy basket, and, like a friend house or something but like i didn't see the 2000s movie i watched the first michael bay one um i think i'm like pvod but like i I genuinely have like no feelings either way so it's one of those things where people get like really up in arms about the teenage mutant ninja turtles i just kind of have to shrug i'm like i I genuinely have no idea (laughs) like i know what they are i know what the characters are like I'm, i'm aware enough of like the general universe of them but like on like a more like focused level, so I'm just kind of like a shrug. Like I, I have no idea. So it was kind of nice coming into this without any sort of expectations, I guess. Like if you can have expectations for a movie about talking turtles, and, you know, the the do ninja stuff. Like I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think I saw the live action movies until later on. Like I think I watched those in preparation for the 2010s. Films. And I think the first actual like theatrical Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie I saw was the 2007 one, which I could not tell you like four things about that movie other than like it's CG animated and it has the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles characters in them. I mean, I thought, you know, at the time, of course, that making it animated made a lot more sense, you know, not only because it's based on a graphic novel property, but also just... I mean, I think there is certainly a charm to the uh, the previous 90s movies just because they are so goofy and, and you know, obviously there's just a lot of cheese outside of their pizzas, of course, on it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I just remember thinking when I saw that 2001, I was like, okay, maybe this is like what we should do with this property. I, I think that that one, though, it was a little too, I don't know if I want to say glum because, I, I, I mean, there might have been jokes and I just don't remember. But I just remember it took itself a little too seriously so it ended up being kind of dull and yeah i just i I didn't really have it didn't make much of an impression on me and then the 2010s ones were just like gross (laughs) at least the the 2014 one i just remember feeling like like they just look bad i i just don't really like the vibe of this i don't think michael bay has the right uh approach i know he didn't technically directed but you know his fingerprints are all over it the out of the shadows one was i think better but not like a a sizable improvement in the sense that it didn't make it worthwhile and so when they didn't end up making a a third one for that and then opted to reboot the franchise with this uh you know new animated film i wasn't like relieved but i was like okay this at least sounds more promising than anything we've gotten in in a good while with this uh these franchise uh, theatrically but uh i don't want to speak for you did you have any real expectations going into this i know seth rogan is of course like a main writer and producer which is what i think appealed to me the most but i was curious what your uh relationship with this film was going into it it's weird like i didn't really i knew it was happening and i'm at a point now where it's like anything rogan does creatively i'm interested in um it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be great by all means but like i feel like he's pretty consistent with what he chooses to do with his time like there's just not a lot of stuff that Seth Rogen's involved with that I feel like it's just like an absolute just like swing and miss um so I was intrigued on that aspect and then it had one of the guys that helped with Mitchell's and the Machines so you know you kind of saw the some of the links there but it was kind of a very like 
back of my mind movie until I saw the trailer and then I thought the trailer looked fun. I was like, oh yeah, that looks like a good time. But I genuinely can't say that I was just like gung ho about seeing it as soon as I could until the reviews started coming out and people started saying like, oh wow, this is actually pretty darn good. And that that piqued my interest um, because I thought the trailer looked pretty fun, but it's not I don't know. I think when you get to a certain age, uh, you're just kind of like, I think I can wait on that one. Um, like with stuff with like Oppenheimer or Barbie, like that's, you know, appointment viewing. But like, I wasn't entirely sure that a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie would qualify for that. But, you know, you know prove me wrong, I guess. Like I, I, I genuinely was very taken aback by the response. And, you know, I wish I hadn't been as much since I knew that Rogan had a heavy hand in the screenplay and he's always been a talented writer. So, um, but I don't know. I, I think that there comes a certain point where even with the freedom that certain filmmakers get with intellectual property, like we saw with Barbie last month and we've seen with like the Lego movie and things like that, like, I just didn't genuinely know what the ceiling was for these characters in general. Like, I mean, there's just a certain point where something can just be so stupid, honestly, where you just kind of shrug and go, you know, I'm sure someone could make this fun, but I don't understand how you could make this emotionally resonant or profound because these are talking turtles that do ninja stuff. Like there, there just comes a certain point where it's like, you can always stretch your imagination so far, but I was proven wrong with this. I, I definitely think that they crossed any expectations I possibly could have had. Yeah, I mean, I will say with full confidence that this is probably the most fun I've had with a TMNT property since I believe it was called the Turtles Awesome Christmas Special, which is the only Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles VHS that I owned as a kid. I'm not exactly sure how I got into possession of it, or why that one uh, ultimately uh, swayed my parents. Maybe it was just they thought potentially I'd learn about Jesus in this in this uh, Christmas or uh, Easter special with uh, mutilated teenage turtles. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, I mean, I will say with full confidence that this is the most fun I've had with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles since the Turtles awesome Easter special. And you can put that on the poster right there. You can. And I feel like that that's probably like a mid nineties, like the, the, cause they did like, they've done like multiple television shows with this. So that had to have been like some sort of like a TV tie in, I would guess. Or was it like the live action ones? Oh, it was totally animated. I mean, okay. I don't remember exactly what the plot was. I know it has to do with the Easter bunny and not, you know, Jesus, but uh, you know, I think it was something with they had to get the Easter Bunny his basket again or something, and then I'm sure they they shared uh, a pie, a pizza pie together at some point. But um, yeah, I mean, I I was thinking it would be amazing if there was like you know how like the Rugrats yeah. kind of explored religion in oh, a number yeah. of their specials, you know, Passover and Kwanzaa in addition to like Christmas and what have you. I I do think it would have been interesting to explore the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming to terms with the death and uh, resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ. Do you think that the 2014 Ninja Turtles, like what religion would they have explored since they kind of looked like unholy abominations, like on the level of like Jeff Goldblum and the fly? Like they, they looked like creatures that would spite any sort of creator for how they're created. I don't know. There's like, there's some, there, there, what, what religion do you think they would try to find meaning in? Um, so, I mean, they're not made in God's image, of course. So uh, I think there would be, uh, you know, like I, I don't think they would be taught uh, Christianity at any point. And I don't think that's something that Master Splinter would uh, teach him in between, you know, uh, ninja related courses. Do you but think they'd be like the Midsommar people? They like take on like the like a pagan, like Nordic Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I could totally see that. Like those people just, they're smiling. The next thing you look over and there's like the 2014 Ninja Turtles holding like a mallet. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I think they would just inherently pick up a variety of religions from the sewers. Like I think they would yeah. have 
uh, you know, like I don't think they would know the names, but I think they would pick up. You know, New York is a pretty bustling, culturally uh, wide city, so I think they would. You know, I, I am sure they would. Uh, you know, be privy to a number of religions. I think they would just practice their own. I think it would be a kind of uh, yeah. you know, like a coexist sort of thing. But like they wouldn't know like coexist. I think they would just think that's what religion is. Like they wouldn't know like the terminologies and all that. So just, I think they would yeah. uh, have awareness of a higher being, but not want to, <laughs> you know, like to put labels on it per se. It's possible that like they could somehow like rip a hole in the space time continuum and figure out that like Michael Bay created them and then like take on Bayhem as a religion. I mean, that would be interesting, I think. It's like if Michael Bay is like God to them and has to like, they have to just like follow the tenets of Bayhem. Poppy doesn't agree. Poppy thinks that they would just be Southern Baptists. So that's, I, I think that could be possible, Pop. I agree. Yeah, well, in any case, uh, <laughs> this has to be one of the weirder tangents I think we've uh, gone yeah. on. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, going back to the movie, uh, you you kind of teased your thoughts already. But, Corey, tell me what you thought about Teenage Mutant and Cheryl's colon mutant mayhem. You know, I really, really, really loved it. I, I was so caught off guard by how much I enjoyed it um, and how impressed I was with the animation, the storytelling. I thought there was a really strong emotional current. I thought that all the characters had really fun personalities. I thought the character design was great. Um, I thought the script was airtight um, and really went into some interesting directions with like a very singular focus on its theme. I, I just these are just not things I thought I would be saying about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Like, and I know that we're like in a post Lego movie society where it's like you can't be that surprised by a film like this working because people seem to be able to make anything out of everything these days. But like. I'm in like a hats off scenario with this. Like I, I genuinely thought it was as good as the last Spider Verse thing that came out in June. Like I, I, as as much as that film may stand apart a little bit in the animation department, since that one is just like a just gorgeously animated. But maybe this is bad. But like I thought that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie told a more satisfying story. Um, I thought it was just it was nice to have it be very confined, and it felt like a very just it was very emotionally satisfying and really naughty kind of you know and you know just thinking about kind of like what the villain's role was and what they were doing and how it kind of made sense why they would want to do what they're I don't know there was just like a there was an understandability there that and just kind of how it tied into the main turtles and the way they looked at the world like I just I don't understand how I'm talking about this about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie that Nickelodeon co-produced, but I don't know. This is just the world we're in with animation right now. Like this is like this is a post Lord Miller, you know, all the people that got they influenced and all of the weird like cartoon shows on like Disney and Cartoon Network that have spawned animators that have gone on to do really interesting things at the feature level. Like we're just we're in a really cool place where animators can really just let this stuff be great without having to really tie it down too much with other stuff going on in the background. So, you know, I don't feel like this film was trying too hard to start a franchise. I don't feel like it was trying too hard to sell toys. Like it genuinely felt like there was a very serious approach to make a really good TMNT movie, which mm -hmm. I'm very taken aback by. And just yeah. some of the little, you know, problems I had here and there with spider versus story and how it kind of dragged a little bit and how it didn't really end in a way that I thought was super satisfying as much as I really, really liked that movie um, and loved some of it. Like I just, I felt like this was just so economic and it's really nice to have that. Like it reminded me honestly of like the first spider verse movie where it's like, you really felt like they didn't really waste a lot of moments and it just felt like it just had a great pace. And I don't know. I mean, you you know, I know that that film is like a landmark now for the way animation is done, but I feel like this is probably one of the best post Spider Verse movies that we've gotten. Like, I was wow. very, I don't know, it's weird. Like, of the films that that movie has inspired, like, this is probably one of the best versions of what that's brought us. So, I'm, I'm very surprised I'm saying that, but yeah, yeah I, I feel pretty strongly that this is actually a pretty great movie. 
Yeah, I definitely uh, echo what you say about in terms of Seth Rogen. I feel like people, I don't know, it's weird because I think people underestimate his talents in some ways. Like he has been a pretty wide pop culture force for 15, I think almost going on like 20 years now, which is weird yeah. to think about. But I think because he does do fairly, you know, sophomoric films, like, you know, even the trailers for this film call him like permanent teenager Seth Rogen. I think mm-hmm. people just kind of assume that he makes, you know, sort of easy frat boy kind of, you know, weed jokes, sex jokes, what have you. But he really does seem to have, uh, particularly as a writer, a pretty keen sense of like characters and dialogue and setting and uh, interior motivations. And I think that really shines here. I mean, I know he's not the only screenwriter involved. Obviously, Evan Goldberg helped write it. And there are a few other writers involved with the project as well. But um, yeah, I just think that this was, you know, from what I had heard, it was kind of his baby. Like this was a passion project that uh, I, I heard that he came to, to Paramount and Nickelodeon. Uh, I think he was kind of cashing in on uh, some of the goodwill that he got from, you know, being involved with the boys and uh, some other projects. And, you know, I think it really shows like this is a very, like you said, visually inventive film, but it's also very heartfelt. And and it's one of the few, which is weird to think about, but it's one of the few Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies that seems to recognize and play with the fact that they are teenagers. Like, I feel like that's been a concurrent issue with a lot of the THB Ninja Turtle things I've seen outside of the animated specials is that like, it's very obvious that these are like adults just playing like goofy teenagers, but it comes across like they're just like 20 year old man children in like awkward suits and stuff. Like oh, especially yeah. the Bay movies. Oh yeah. The Bay movies they are like in their mid forties. Like there's a certain point where you're like, are they having midlife crises? Right. <laughs> it's like, are they already having back issues? Like, are, is, like, is one of them like divorced? Like, I don't know. There's like a certain point where it's just like, how <laughs> adults are these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Like, they have like five o'clock shadow, right. and you know, they, they, they've seen some stuff. Like, I, I don't really know if that's how these characters are supposed mm-hmm. to function. At least two of them have child support payments that they have to <laughs> yeah, they pay. do. Donatello and Michelangelo. Right. They just have to, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I think. Rogan does have a really good sense, obviously, like, like super bad. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like I'm trying to think of some of the other more high school related projects that he's worked on. I guess that's probably the most prominent one. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I just think he really knows how to, uh, you know, play with, you know, like this sort of adolescent mindset, but not in a way that feels, you know, like uh, like they're laughing at it or like that's a joke. It seems to really take their sort of like juvenile aspirations and motivations with some seriousness and some heart and i think that's something that really stood out to me in addition to like you're saying the animation which obviously you know it's kind of similar to uh the most recent puss in boots movie in a sense that very obviously it's inspired by uh the animation style and it's not shy about taking from it Mm -hmm. but i think you know it's one of those things where you know kind of like how uh i you know john wick caused other um action movies to not lean on the taken approach of like shaky cam Mm -hmm. and like bad fight choreography, but like actually focus on their visuals and fight styles. I I do think that spider verse does seem to be having a positive effect on uh, the animation industry. And it's, it's causing people to be like, we have to be a little bit more inventive, not only because I think they want to, but because I think that's sort of the expectation now is that like people want, like you've gotten these spider verse movies and people are just like, if we just, you know, make some wonky, you know, CG movie, I I think people are going to like, uh, just think it's outdated old hat or something. I mean, the, even the Pixar style was influenced a little bit by spider verse. Like I look at a movie like turning red and you just didn't get the same, you know, Pixar house style necessarily. It seemed like they were trying to be a little bit more outside of their comfort zone. And like the new animated film, Disney's doing wish, um, that's, slated right now to come out in November might get pushed. Um, They're implementing a little bit more 2D, 3D kind of hand joining, I suppose. So yeah, I mean, Spider-Verse was like a landmark moment for animation. Like there's like, there's, it's just like pre post Spider-Verse at this point for the way that films are animated, the way stories are told. And, you know, the irony to me is like, I think that, you know, 
it's 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 strange to think that like we're going back to a little bit more 2D because of just how prevalent 3D was for so long, and it just kind of if it's a breath, it's a you know it's it's just a breath of fresh air. I mean, I'm thankful that this is the way animation is going, and people are getting more opportunities to try styles like this. Um, but I. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm maybe I don't think this is going to spark like a full 2D movie. Uh, I, I, that would be great. I would love it. But, um, you know, I think this is just a happy medium. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that other studios are like copying this a little bit because it's it's just it's just nice. I, the, the, the really lazy 3D was just getting really, really tiring. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think what's so appealing about the animation style for me about this one, the Spider-Verse style, is that. You know, like in my head, if I were to imagine uh, if such a thing is possible, the mindset of these characters, like what they would want a movie about themselves to be like, that's influenced by the things that they are inspired by, the movies and media that they consumed. It would be closer, I think, to this style than something, uh, you know, like what we saw in the more recent uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. Like, I think it is, you know, like they they would view themselves as kind of like these wacky you know uh you know balance of like anime and uh yeah like you said like cg and 2d and comics and like the stuff they would draw on their notebooks and stuff it just feels very uh inspired in that way it doesn't just feel like they're kind of chasing a trend uh at least that's why i felt like watching the animation of this film yeah, and like the anime influence is a really good observation because there's like a whole Attack on Titan bit in this movie, like one of the characters is like, you know, particularly like the Gen Z has really embraced anime past like the obvious kind of focal points like Ghibli, uh, Studio Ghibli and Dragon Ball Z. Like it feels like they are very well educated in, you know, that style of animation. And I feel like this film really understands that and kind of plays with it in some really cool ways because you can do that with the martial arts background you can do that with you know having jackie chan in there voicing master splinter like and i feel like this film pays as much homage as you can with that as a kids nickelodeon movie but i don't know i felt like there was just a really cool blending of so many different influences um to where it kind of almost feels like it blends so much together that's different to where it kind of feels like its own thing which i think is the hope of what you want in our continual age of kind of referential cinema yeah i mean that is one of those things that i've kind of been trying to notice is that yeah, it, it does seem like there is with this younger Gen Z uh, generation and also with like Alpha coming forward that their media consumption has been so influenced by the Internet and like the fast pace uh, style of a lot of the, the content that they've consumed that, you know, like something like anime, it, it doesn't feel like too manic or uh, intense. Like it, I think it's just more natural and e- more accessible than it's probably ever been, at least for uh you know western audiences and yeah so i think the influence has been pretty strong and obviously you know when it comes to attack on titan it, it is given a fair bit of lip service but you know it, it does feel uh you know it doesn't feel like it's cheapening uh the film here it does it does provide a pretty fun uh climax here that uh, that definitely feels very uh as i've said before inspired and uh you know it just amusing and fun and yeah it just makes for some really fun summer entertainment for the youngins all right but um yeah i did want to talk to you a little bit about uh the voice cast because you brought up yeah. um jackie chan who obviously is a uh, master splinter and you know it, it always warms my heart to even just hear jackie chan you know because i mean i i really just don't know at this point how many movies we're gonna get with Jackie Chan from this point forward. So any chance I can spend with Jackie uh, is always a a plus in my book, but I wanted to hear a little bit from you. Uh, Were there any performances uh, that stood out to you or anything that uh, you really clocked while you're watching this movie? Yeah. I mean, I thought the main four all did a really nice job. You know, it's just a lot of relatively unknown young kids who just seem like they really enjoyed. I saw that there's like a video of them all recording together. So I think that they did a smart strategy of just having them like hang out and do their voice work together. And it really seems like it's just a bunch of kids doing their thing, which is all you can really hope for in a performance Mm -hmm. like that. Um, 
you know, I think uh, Ayo Ebediri or Edabiri is having like a really, really good summer um, for all the things that she's appeared in. I thought she was pretty great as April O'Neil. Um, I think that that character seems to have gotten a lot more to do here um, than maybe she normally does. Like it just feels like she was a lot more integral to the plot. Um, and I thought she did a really nice job. Um, I really enjoyed Paul Rudd as uh, a character uh, named Mondo Gecko. Um, that was probably one of the very easy highlights of kind of the mutant supporting cast because there's like all these little mutant characters that are around, you know, helping the bad guy. Um, and then obviously Ice Cube plays the main bad guy who's like this housefly mutant bad thing named Superfly. And I thought he was actually pretty darn good um, for what he was doing. So um, those were probably the ones that when I kind of look back on this one that I feel like were more kind of stand out than other, but it's a really cool little voice cast. And, you know, I think that mm-hmm. some of this probably was like people like being like, Oh, it's Seth Rogan. Yeah. I'll do this. Cause I love him. So, mm-hmm. um, I do think there was somewhat of a, you know, friends doing friends favors thing, but you know, for what it is, I thought everybody did a good job. Yeah. I mean, especially cause you know, like you said, the the four, the core four here um, are fairly unknowns, at least to me. I mean, maybe they're uh, bigger stars than I know. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's so crucial to have their camaraderie and chemistry shine through their performances. And I, I didn't know that they recorded together, but it doesn't surprise me because I think they really are good about bouncing off each other and feeling like real friends in a way that like when I think back on you know even just the michael bay ones not to harp on those ones too much but i mean i just think like oh those are very sort of stilted people like i don't get the sense of their friends like i I just feel like they like they're brothers obviously but i just feel like it's like they just have this call they have to do and you know like if they could they would all separate from each other because they they don't even like looking at each other's faces which i don't blame them because they are not uh, the prettiest bunch but yeah i mean i think this one really uh, in addition to making the characters feel young i definitely think that it, it helps to have that camaraderie in place it feels very heartfelt and, and genuine but yeah um yeah you definitely highlighted the three voice performances that i was going to talk about i mean i think the fact that april o'neill feels like a more 3d fleshed out character here than she has in the past is definitely a huge win for the film uh you know because april always just kind of feels a little flat to me in the other ones and i think this one really makes her personality come alive in a in a big and exciting way and yeah paul Rudd's definitely the funniest performance i think as well uh and then yeah you mentioned like ice cube just giving another really strong voice performance um the only ones i would highlight other than that i think would be uh john carlo espinito plays a small but mm. like really uh i mean he always is really good about giving voice performances and this is no exception uh and then also i mean i didn't know it was him until after the movie but I'm not the biggest Post Malone fan, but I thought he was actually pretty funny in this film. Like, I oh, think yeah. his uh, his little character, I won't give away the joke of it, but it's actually a pretty good little bit and uh, gave me some good solid chuckles. Um, yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, one of the things about this film that I'm still, like, thinking about is, like, I thought the theme kind of was deep. Like, you have the obvious, like, family sticks together and getting along stuff that you kind of would just feel like is kind of baked into these characters. Um, but there was like some really thorny aspects of like societal acceptance and what people are willing to do to get the respect they feel like they deserve in society. And kind of the hook here is like that the big super fly guy feels like that humans are never going to embrace these animals. So he's kind of like, well, if they're not going to like us, we're literally going to get rid of all the humans that take over the planet. And there comes a certain point where you're kind of like, you don't, it's obviously terrible that, you know, someone's trying to do that in a general sense, very anti humans being taken out of earth. But, um, I don't know. There was like the way it paralleled with like master splinter, not being able to be accepted in the real world and the turtle. It's just like, there was like this really interesting dichotomy of like, what are you willing to do to be accepted by society if you're different? And while that's not like all that, you know, foreign to the way that 
film operates. Like that's a pretty common theme. I thought the way they tackled it was actually pretty sophisticated. And there was like a there was a darkness there and kind of an uncompromising with the way that the villain was operating that I thought was kind of refreshing. Like that there was like a there's like there's a real sense of danger in this. Like that there's like a there's there's, a, there's this guy who's like it's it's not really that you know kitty. Like he's willing to resort to violence and do bad stuff because he feels like he wants to be accepted by a society that kind of created him, I guess, you know, this is the way that they went after the guy that, you know, made him in the lab and kind of the human antagonist aspect of it that um, we can leave for the film. But I don't know. I thought that was interesting. I, I just, I think that's the Rogan and Goldberg effect of it is that they're not afraid to like explore some darker avenues and allow it to be a little more edgy. Um, because I've, I felt like, you know, that again, you know, you hit the nail on the head earlier. Like these films can very easily get bland and self serious. Um, but I thought that there was like a really nice meshing between like the gross out kind of immature, you know, juvenile aspect of it. Um, and then the kind of the darker, like more, you know, sympathetic in an uncomfortable way, you know, duality of what, what are you, what are you going to do to be accepted in the world that you're in? And I, I just can't believe that that's the type of stuff that like is a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie is exploring, but I give them a lot of props for that because um, I thought that that was a really neat little twist for kind of what you would normally expect out of something like mm-hmm. this. Yeah. And I mean, in addition to that, there's, uh, I mean, maybe a little bit standard as far as messages are concerned, but the, the subplot with, um, master splinter, like having him accept that he has to like, let his children go. And like the, the fear of like over parenting and stuff is kind of intriguing in this film. Cause normally in these type of kids films, it's just like, you know, we just have to wait for, the parental figure to kind of like learn their lesson. But in this case, like it makes sense. Like splinters, like, yeah, the world's scary and they're not probably going to accept you. It's like, he's, he's not wrong. I mean, you know, like I, I, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's hard for humans to accept these mutilated, uh, you know, creatures. So I think that as far as how it's incorporate that message, I think is a lot more thoughtful and, and intriguing, than we would get from like maybe some other print or um, PG related films. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And it's very uh, cynical about the way that uh, media functions and how, <clears throat> you know, people look at things that they don't understand and they put like a lens on it. And because again, it takes April O'Neill, um, you know, a part of her big thing in the movie is that she wants to unveil this big super plot. And, um, you know, it's like, if there aren't people out there who are actively trying to like cover things with like empathy almost and not just like rushing to, I don't know. That was just like another, again, it's all stupid because it's about turtles and giant, you know, animal mutants or whatever, but it's like, it just, it felt like this movie wasn't, it it wasn't like, you know, shaved off, I guess. Um, uh, Sorry. Poppy. Okay, what was that, Poppy? Okay, <laughs> Poppy thinks that um, Seth Rogen should go back to doing live action comedies, and that wow, we okay. need to quit. Yeah, yeah, and that we need to quit relying on animation to uh, that's been regurgitated through the years to kind of give us an idea of putting more originality back into the hands of our youth. Hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Wow. That was that was profound. Um, didn't expect that. Um, you know, I think it, there's a happy medium that you meet Poppy, um, you know, with the way this all goes, but you know, I definitely, I definitely respect her viewpoints on it. Does Poppy have a favorite? Um, oh, wow. Does she have a favorite, uh, Seth Rogen film or production? Um, she said, uh, uh, take this waltz, the Sarah Polly film. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. She, it seems like Poppy is pretty, you know, sophisticated taste. She is. She is. She's a bit of a film snob, but you know, we, we, we get there. Uh, okay um well i don't want to cut her off but uh does she have any takes on the more dramatic turns that seth rogan has taken recently like in the fablements um she thinks that he needs to keep exploring that side of himself but he also needs to remember that he's you know definitely a funny guy and that you know i think it's balancing his influence on the comedy space to kind of keep that genre going while allowing himself to take on projects that challenge him as an actor so i think that's Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Poppy. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate her feedback. You know, it, it definitely seemed like she really took issue with what you just said there. And I wasn't uh, quite sure why at first. But now, yeah, it seems like she's really uh, uh, having some interesting things to say and then provides this conversation. So I appreciate her uh, putting in her input. Um, yeah, you also brought up, I think at one point, the uh, the character designs for it. The, the film and i i definitely have to agree with that it kind of reminded me at times of the character design for rango as far as like there's something about these characters that are like not talking about the turtles necessarily but yeah like with the other mutants and even with the humans they have like these sort of like asymmetrical faces and like bulging eyes and just like weird facial features that you know it, it's like almost like ugly and cute at the same time like it's just it, it has a very uh, you know, poppy look to it. It Not also yet. it also kind of remind me of some of like the humans from like uh, the Leica films, uh, yeah. as far as like how they, they their faces and chins are oh, yeah. structured and shaped. But yeah, I just felt like the animators really had fun. With not only like these creatures, but like with just the humans in general, just designing oh, yeah. and, and I'm really, yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because I had definitely picked up a Henry Selleck vibe from this. Like, there's definitely with because that's one of the cool things about the Spider Verse form is that it definitely is borrowing from stop motion movement um, and the way that it kind of uses imagery to kind of transpose like actual things that are coming in sequence with the way that they shoot stop motion, obviously, which is a very painstaking but beautiful process. Um, but yeah, I definitely picked up some like Selick Burton vibes in there a little bit, um, especially with the way that the villains operated and the way they moved. And I don't know, there's just, it was kind of nice to have that because I think that that's another kind of stylistic reference point that can work in your favor when you really do it well. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, we could bring up. Um, yeah, I mean, did you have any thoughts on, like, in addition to the anime influence and some of the animation influence, there's just some really kind of surprising uh, source of inspiration elsewhere. Like, there's an extended fight montage that takes from uh, Old Boy, uh, you know, like the the famous Hammer sequence. Yeah. Uh, and I think even Jeff Rowe, the director, confirmed that was the influence for it. But then there's, like other kind of odd little like uh cues from like i think like saving private ryan at one point and then like maybe like heat for some like the well, high scenes so yeah there's some great needle drops in this too there's like a whole fight sequence to um no diggity by Black right Street. yeah that's the one and, i'm talking about yeah 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 and uh it's just it's great i mean it's just it's really great and then what's the song that they use over the big chase scene with the cars where they're singing it in the vehicle i cannot it's like you know the song i just cannot remember who sings i think it's like an alanis morissette song potentially or like a cranberry song um but oh, I you're talking kidnap. about the um oh what song is that it's, it's been like a little over a week since i've seen this so i'm trying yeah. to think um uh isn't that um isn't what's going on like and i wake up in the morning yeah and that's yeah, it yeah 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 which is no that's 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 melissa etheridge oh okay. um okay yeah so some one of the 90s people um yeah but that was great because you kind of get like paul rudd singing it too and it's just like it's just it's very funny and it's just very well done um there's like a little bit of Edgar Wright in there, honestly, with the way that they use music and the way they kind of inter and kind of intersplice it over the action. Like, I don't know. It's just it's a, it's a movie that knows its stuff. And I think that's one thing about Rogan and Goldberg is that they are very intelligent filmmakers in the way that they have learned reference through all of the media that they have consumed. And again, that's that's the thing about a lot of great directors is they're just doing things that they've seen before with their own perspective. And I think that's just how a lot of these, you know, films work in a way is that, you know, it's, it's the Tarantino style of just like, you know, borrowing different influences here and doing it there. And then you kind of have the nostalgia of 90s hip hop. And I didn't see the new Transformers movie, but apparently like they used a lot of 90s hip hop in that too. Mm. Um, I'll be honest. I got like four minutes into it and I just turned it off because I just, I don't know. There was just a certain point where I was just like, I don't know if I have two hours for yeah. talking robots, but um, you know, talking about animal planets and stuff, but like, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the way that Goldberg and Rogan are able to mesh together their nostalgia for what they grew up with, with like a very healthy knowledge of 
the great films and the way that the great directors operate. Like, you know, even though they're not the filmmakers here, like you can tell that they're the ones that are looking over the shoulder here. And like, obviously Jeff Rowe did Mitchell's and the machines as like a co-director, I believe, or at least someone who was higher up on the production. So, you know, I just have a lot of respect for the way that mm-hmm. this film handles its business. So, um, yeah. you know, which I think is really nice. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it is fairly, fairly uh, comparable to like Phil Lore and Chris Miller with Spider-Verse movies where they didn't, right. they're not directing it, but you know, they, their influence, their fingers are all over the product. And I think, you know, maybe not to the same extent, but I feel like Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg had a similar sort of influence oh, yeah. on this film. But yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you brought the soundtrack and Tarantino because uh, I think in the past on this show, we've called Tarantino style filmmaking like mixtape cinema, mm-hmm. where it kind of feels like he's taking, you know, these influences of his, whether it's, uh, you know, in film or mu- music or media in general, and just kind of adds its own spin to it. And I think that's even maybe more comparable in this film where you see, like we we're saying, like all these influences from the soundtrack to the visuals to the story and tone, but it also feels like it's integrating its own sense of personality to it, its own messaging and, and what it wants to say. It doesn't feel like it's just kind of using those influences as a crutch, but rather taking those elements and things that they really like and applying to these characters that they've been, you know, probably really big fans of for a great deal of their life, but also just doing something that feels true to them as storytellers and artists and yeah it just makes her some fun uh summer entertainment yes it does and you know for a summer that's been pretty hit and miss i think um this is definitely one of the bright spots um you know and i think that it's it's doing pretty well at the box office i think it'll obviously have legs because of the whole they don't make as many family films anymore so there's just gonna be a lot of kids going to see this as school gets started and it's gonna be like a friday treat in a way um, there's not a lot of competition for children's films for a while. So I think this will definitely have a ton of room to grow in terms of word of mouth and the reviews are really strong. And I think people are going to start coming out to see this from all ages. So I think it's going to be a, you know, a, a kind of a slam dunk for Paramount and for, uh, you know, Nickelodeon and for everybody involved, they've already got a TV show and a sequel greenlit. So this is definitely not the end of these, ten, these Ninja Turtles um, and the iteration they're in. I just hope that they maintain this quality in the next film um, because this could be a pretty neat little movie series to have to look forward to during this time of the year um, because it's like as grand and as much as I just love the animation style and the ambition and just some of the scenes in like the new Spider-Verse that are just like all time stunning. It's just nice to have something compact and that doesn't depend on another movie that hasn't been made yet. Like I'm just, I think I'm just becoming a little bit lethargic with like the Havsies storytelling. Um, I think the new Spider-Verse film would have been stronger without that approach and more of a kind of a curved off ending, but you know, this had that. So I definitely appreciated that particularly because of just the way that as much as I really, again, I, you know, I've said caveats cause I think Spider-Verse is a great movie, but I just did not feel like the ending was as emotionally satisfying. I just, I really felt like it just felt like a, a cliffhanger in a way that really felt like it just ended mid movie. And I just, I don't feel like I got mm-hmm. anything else that I needed to kind of feel resolute with that story, um, which you can pull off, but it's like, it's just, it's just hard to do that. And I don't think that they did the best job with that on that one. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's a minor flaw on a major work, but you know, I think that this movie, you obviously, since it's the, the first of it, you get the benefit of just like there being a finality that I feel like is very important for animated films in particular. Yeah. I mean, I have, similarly kind of been uh you know not super I, i'm not quite sure what the word i'm looking for but um it the, the ending for the most recent spider movie as time has gone on hasn't really sat well with me like at the time i was just like okay yeah i mean you know i was told going in you know like the title even says part one so i was expecting that cliffhanger but when i think about everything that movie does well in the sense that it doesn't really have a fully complete ending. I think they try their best to work around it, but it does kind of feel impartial for that reason. And then when I think back on um, 
the films I've loved this year, like the films that are like my favorite so far, I find that Spider-Verse kind of has been going down a little bit on my list because yeah. of my, you know, sort of uh, mixed feelings on the ending there. But yeah, I mean, I think as far as the this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies goes, like I was going to go into this review. Like, I, I, I like the film. I, I don't think I'm like as high on it as you are, but like I was going to go in like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm enthusiastic about it. It's clear to see what's fun about it. But yeah, just talking about it with you, I mean, I've, I think I've even grown to appreciate this movie more and, and respect what it did and, and what it pulled off, especially for a franchise and a series of characters I'd never really had a particularly strong relationship to in the past. So I definitely think fans are going to be pretty won over by this. I, I think as we've been suggesting, I think even non fans will probably have a really good time with this. And yeah, I mean, just uh, it scratches a good itch. It and does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It's just like, you know, it's a, it's a good a minus movie. Like, I don't think it's perfect. I don't think it quite like reaches the, the highs of like a spider verse are just like, all time level like you can just tell there is a playing field that they are working on in those films that when it really hits its stride is just like as good as anything that we have um but i feel like this film kind of knocks it out a little bit um there, there is like a there is like you can kind of see it popping up every now and again um that it's really clicking in that way i don't think the film consistently does but like you know, I but that's the thing is like I would probably give the latest Spider Verse film an A minus too if I was grading it. Like I, I think that they're, you know, what even though this film doesn't reach those highs as much as Spider Verse does, like I think it has a more consistent flow to it that I appreciated. And I'm I'm the same way with Spider Verse. Like I, I just I don't know why that ending was as I don't know. I feel like there was a way to end that movie a little sooner that would have worked better. Like they could have cut off about 20 minutes. I think it's, you know, again, I love animation to death and I don't ever want to say an animated movie is too long because of just how precious you are with runtime and how much, you know, goes into even getting 90 minutes, but like it is too long. It's like, there, there's a little too much going on there that they could have sanded down. Um, but you know, uh, for and I, I, I'm sure I, when I watch it again, I'll appreciate more about what Spider Verse did incredibly well uh, as I kind of focus on it more at home. But you know, I, I just it's just animated films like this just typically don't work out. I mean, this is just a very toy driven, like marketing heavy. You know, it's just it, the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles outside of probably their graphic novel origins have just felt very product heavy. It, just, it feels like content, and I feel like this is probably the first time I've ever engaged with these characters where I didn't just automatically feel like this is just some, you know, dumb film that they just made to sell toys. Like, because again, that's like the craven side of family entertainment that is very gross. And I think this film can accomplish those goals while not sacrificing its artistic integrity. And I think that's a big step for what these movies are trying to do. Like, I feel like the, if you're a fan of these characters i don't understand how you would even like you said in the slightest be disappointed because i feel like someone was finally taking them seriously um outside of just trying to start a television show or put toys in fast food boxes so you know i'm, I'm definitely very pro what they did here right on well said um yeah i only have two uh parting thoughts and one of them is uh, i looked it up the song we were thinking of earlier is uh, What's Up by Four Non Blondes. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's, gotcha. I only really know it from that He-Man video from like the early 2000s. Now that I think about it, I feel like that's my main point of reference to that song. You remember okay. that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the uh, the score from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. That was Ross. great. Yes, yeah, I'm yeah. glad you said that. That this, The score was like absurdly good for a movie like this. Uh, I, I yeah. didn't realize Reznor and Ross did it until I, after the movie was over. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, like, this is actually a really good score for this film, but that makes total sense now that I know who it was. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, they always bring it. They always do such a great job. True, yeah. Uh, any parting thoughts from you? Um, I guess, like, I didn't realize that Hannibal Burris was the frog um, until I was just recording this with you and looking at the Wikipedia page. So shout out Hannibal Burris, who I love. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. It was really nice to... Um, figure out because that's the one voice i couldn't peg um in the cast and now that i know who that was it's just it's nice it's always nice when he pops up anywhere so shout out handle burst yeah definitely agree with you there and any parting oh, thoughts from poppy 
Um, Poppy thinks that uh, she really hopes that whenever the inevitable Shrek film gets redone, that they use the same Puss in Boots style. Um, that she feels like that would mm. really settle well with a tr- with a Shrek film. Sounds good. Uh, She's actually asleep, so yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. She got so worn out sharing her thoughts on Sarah Polly's filmography that she just she has yeah. kind of worked herself into a frenzy there. She did. She did. She's going to watch some Antononi films later, so that'll that'll put her back in a good mood. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, have you ever played the Rotten Tomatoes game on this show, Corey? I think so. Yeah, it's been it's been a minute though. All right. Did you look up the Rotten Tomatoes score for this film? I know the critic one probably roughly okay. in the in the in the in the tens range but i don't think i know the audience uh well what's your prediction for the critics first is it what 94 pretty close it's 96 96 is, okay i i think that well eclipses any previous teenage mutant Ninja turtles uh movie to date i i mm-hmm. am too lazy to look it up and i feel like we're already kind of going long enough that i don't need to well, one this? thing I will say is I don't know if this is the best film this year to feature the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, though. Oh? Blackberry. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a good point. There's like a pivotal scene in that movie that is set to a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles song. That is, um, yeah, I didn't even clock that. But, yeah, thanks for pointing that up. Yeah, and I think that's one of the best movies of the year. So, like, I am head over heels for that one. Oh, so. yeah. Definitely a good one. Uh, what's your prediction for the audience score? 86? Uh, a little less. Uh, you're a little off the mark, I, I mean to say. Uh, sorry, that one. But not too far. Okay. It is currently at 91%. Oh, that's great. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. I'm glad audiences are in with it. Um, yeah. You never can tell with those. Uh, those are very uh, – you just never know how the people are going to react to it. So I'm, I'm glad to know that it's a little higher than I thought. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I mean, you know, I it doesn't surprise me because, I mean, it seems like, you know, people really – are just responding to this film. Uh, definitely that was the case with my audience, and uh, I imagine it was probably for your audience as well. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, so Cinema Score. Have you been spoiled on this one yet? I don't think so. Do you have a guess for the Cinema Score of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, colon, Mutant Mayhem? A? You are exactly right. That is, wow. that is okay. it. it. It is an A. Okay. Those, Kooks in Vegas are like, give us more. Exactly. I mean, they're gonna get more because this is there's another one of these coming out at some point. So um, that's probably I guess gonna have Shredder in it. Is that a is that a spoiler? Like I feel like that's their main villain. Like of course he's probably. I mean, technically it's a spoiler, but like, (laughs) what do you expect? Like I mean, no, seriously, it's like the Joker's in the new Batman movie. Like yeah, no kidding. Like yeah, great. Congratulations. Like you know, really, really, really ingenious uh, plot twist there. Right. I mean, I feel like it would be more of a spoiler to say that Shredder is involved. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Like if they like, because that's the post credit scene in this, and it's just like it would be much funnier if they just like didn't acknowledge him. They're like, oh yeah, we're not doing that. What um, if? Uh, they returned back to the Christian roots and it was just like, you saw the horns and you're yeah. like, oh, that must be Shredder. And it's just Satan. No, it's, uh, it's, um, it's actually Pontius Pilate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's we didn't, guy. we didn't bring you into this world, but we can take you out. That's darn right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, would you say that the, the turtles have souls? I think so. I think everything's got a soul. Uh, you know, I mean, they definitely have, like, ethics and morals. So it's just, like, there's a definite, like, trying to figure out. Like, there's a scene where they have to, like, just determine, like, they're going to do the right thing, even if nobody wants to, like, like them for it. And that's a very selfless attitude. So they they definitely show the fruits of the spirit. Um, so I think that they, I think they will definitely go to heaven. Um, and I think Splinter will go to heaven as well. Um, April will go to heaven. Superfly sure. will probably not go to heaven um, unless he changes his ways. I don't. I don't think that he'll go to heaven. What if he accepted Jesus in his heart before he leaves his mortal plane? Yeah, it's definitely possible. So I mean, you know, there's there's definitely some very intriguing theological discussion to have there with. Um, 
I feel like there was a movie recently that, that they kind of like touched on this with like weird creatures or something. I don't know. I feel like we've, uh, we're at the point now where it's like all movies have probably dealt with everything. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everything has, a, that's the thing. Like, I, there's there, every, Everything has been done. It's kind of like that uh, South Park episode where they're like trying to do stuff. And it's like, oh yeah, the Simpsons did that right. first. Um, that's how it feels these days. It's like everything has already been done. We're just we're just regurgitating ideas and copying each other and just keeping keeping trying to build this cinematic power of Babel before it topples on all of us and we're just watching reality TV shows all that. Well, I'm sure Dave's ass off would be mighty fine with that. Yeah, and I'm sure John is thrilled. This is where the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles conversation is going. Oh, I'm I'm sure he's loving it. Yeah. Um, well, that's what happens when he. Uh, goes i can't see the movie i gotta work cetera, yeah exactly yeah and then you let us loose and right. it just becomes total pandemonium exactly speaking of things that have been done before let's wrap this up with a uh prediction for the letterbox score of okay TH, mutant ninja Turtles: colon mutant mayhem um 3.8 you are I'm sorry. Actually, <laughs> texted out. I think you are exactly. Yeah, you are exactly correct. Wow. Okay. Dope. Yeah. So you got you win the game. Yeah, you got the last two exactly correct, and you were not far off okay. on the All first right. two. Well, I do. I win a pizza. I in my heart, yes. I was going to ask you about okay. pizza. I'm glad you brought it up because yeah. uh, have you been attuned to the pizza wars? No. Okay. So John and I have been fighting. Not really. Not really fighting, but. John and I have had uh, issues in the past where I'm pretty firmly, if I had to choose between Domino's and Pizza Hut, I would pick Pizza Hut. John is like Domino's all the way. Uh, I don't know where you stand, but this movie takes a firm Pizza Hut stance, which I thought it does was awesome. Was a great win for my side in the in the Pizza Wars. I think that's why secretly John didn't. Uh, see this movie because i think he knew you know he saw the signs and was like i didn't want to to deal with that but i want to hear from you where do you stand uh on this pizza wars i mean my pizza wars thing is like if you can ever avoid eating chain pizza do it like i feel like the teenage mutant ninja turtles that's the one thing that might keep them from being fully moral is that they're in like a vibrant city of New York with all these great pizza options and they want pizza. Hut. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> like, is it, is it splinter that did that? Like, I, I really want to dig into who in the world gave them that idea. Um, well, maybe that's just what teenagers who are living underground as turtles would think is good pizza. But I'm hoping in the sequel that they'd like step their pizza game up a little bit. Um, you know, otherwise I don't really know. Like, I think they'll become like, it's kind of like that dark night line. Like, either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain that's how they'll be because of their pizza taste sure like they'll eat so much pizza hut for so long they're just like i don't understand this our lives are meaningless let's just mm. like rob banks and whatever but <clears throat> i would probably go with pizza hut over Domino's. nice yeah I welcome would think to the resistance yeah because of the stuffed crust um and yes. pizza hut's just got a little bit more of a nostalgic factor and it's like, I don't trust a $5 pizza. I'm sorry, Domino's. It's like the Little Caesars conundrum. Like, I don't trust a, a pizza that's $5. So you got to you gotta work harder than that. Well, I'll put it this way. I mean, I've never gotten a pizza from Domino's because of my report card or because I read a book. Mm-hmm. That's the dang truth. Uh, that is yeah. the dang truth. Like, again, yeah, scholastic achievements are not Pizza Hut. They earn the personal pan pizza. They do not earn whatever abomination Domino's is serving children. That is true. Yeah, Pizza Hut doesn't try to do sandwiches, okay? Like, Domino's yeah. is the one that tried to do sandwiches. They're the ones that breached the unholy grail. So it's just like they're going to have to drink from it. That is true. Yeah, I mean, I was going to joke uh, as well that, you know, in the, in the sequel, they evolved from Pizza Hut to Sabaro. <laughs> That's the, the Michael Scott line. Ah, I find yeah. fine New York pizza. I'm just... <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, but I guess even the turtles, uh, the sewer people that they are, are uh, unable to avoid, uh, you know, the depths of capitalism, which yeah, is pretty sad. Sadly so it is. It's incredibly sad. I'm just I'm very sad that um, this is where all this is all going, because everyone falls to capitalism at some point. And sadly, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles basically exist to fuel capitalistic toy cells so yeah you know, at least at least if they can save the day while they do it it's okay with me that is true that's a good note to end it on a nice bleak little note there <laughs> uh thank you Corey, as always for joining us 
Yeah, man. Obviously, this is like quintessential Will and Corey podcasting. So I'm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just he it goes into so many different things. We talked about theology. We talked about pizza. We talked about. Seth Rogen from yeah. a dog's perspective. Like we just we do everything. And this is probably the reason why me and you don't have a regular <laughs> <laughs> True, true. Uh yeah, I mean, uh yeah, our smoothest conversation for sure. I yes. hope the edit is smoother, and I apologize to John if it's not. Uh <laughs> but and I apologize to listeners, of course, just in general. Yeah. Uh I also want to thank Poppy for all of her uh, integral input as well. Yeah. She is definitely asleep right now. Yeah. And is, she says thank you to all the viewers and make sure that you sign up for the Criterion channel. Um, oh. She gets kickbacks from them when she says that. So, um, Right on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. From the Internet, Pennsylvania, I'm Lashin. From my kitchen table, I'm Corey Woodruff. All right. And with that, Calabunga, dude. <laughs>